just briefly, just for a minute, I, I have this, this amazing thought that's been birthed in my heart this, over this last week. And uh, as we've been talking about, this is the final in our series, Because of You. And as we've been talking about the last three, four weeks, we've been talking about what happens as a direct result of our decision to commit to the works of Christ. That amazing things result when we decide that we are going to live fully and completely for God. When we devote ourselves to his plan, lives are changed. That we want it to be the thankful prayer of our peers that go to those around them or that speak to God himself and say, thank you, God, for them. Thank you, God, for them. It, you know, Paul himself said it so perfectly in Ephesians chapter 3. So perfectly in Ephesians chapter 3. Actually, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Sorry. How... How we thank God for you. Because of you, we have great joy as we enter God's presence. How we thank God for you. And I don't know about you, but I want my life to be like that. When people talk about what is happening, I want them to say, wow, I thank God for you being there for me. I thank God for your encouragement. I thank God because I know that you have decided to alert yourself to what God's plan is and have gone forward and I feel like God's heartbeat, God's passion for what he wants to do is becoming more alive in me. And I pray that as a result of what you've been hearing that it's becoming more alive in you. And we can find these places of hope and we can find these places of such great excitement and thrill about what God is doing but the truth is sometimes even when we begin to move forward plan of God and we begin to do what he has desired us to do and we begin to do what he has designed for us to do, we face resistance. We face moments of trouble and moments of difficulty and moments of challenge, moments where we say very openly and honestly, we need a miracle. We need a miracle. And, and I just, I want to encourage you with this thought. I want to encourage you with this reality that, that sometimes when we get into these places where we struggle so much, where we find things so difficult and so challenging that we can lean on God to overcome. And, and there's, there's, this, there's this amazing factor that goes into place here, but I want to outline this for just a moment. You see, for years, people have been trying to perfect a, a method. Like someone will come to them with, with a need, or someone will come to them with a struggle, someone will come to them with what's going on in their life, and we can say, what can we do to affect a world full of such great and complex problems? What can we do? What can we do? Like, it's my understanding and my perspective that as things change, as things progress, Problems in our society are becoming more and more challenging to deal with, more and more difficult, more and more complex. And some of us have packaged statements or cliche statements or, you know, if God brought you to it, it'll bring you through it. I mean, I've said that before, or, you know, God won't allow anything to happen to you that you can't handle. And all these different things that we hope bring encouragement and we hope bring help to those who are struggling. But the intricacy of these problems that we're facing are growing more and more complicated and more and more challenging to experience. And many of us walk around thinking that we need a miracle, desiring a miracle, desiring for something big, something great to happen. And we feel this tension as a church. Because there are people that call this place. There are people that come to this place. There are people that engage us and say, you're the, you're the context, you're the place, you're the, the bridge between God and I. I need you to make this happen somehow, some way. And some of the things that come our way can make even the most full of faith, even the most devoted believer, even the most strong Christian, to cause them to honor and wonder, how can I do anything about this? What can I do to change this? How can I fix this? How can I deal with this? And somehow, we find ourselves inviting the church. Like, come to church. 
I don't know where. I don't know how. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know at what setting it's going to take place. But if I can get you here and I can get you among these people that love so greatly, and if I can get you around a place where you can feel God, where you can hear truth, just maybe. And there's something that happens because it's happened in our church. And it's like this, this, this challenging for me to explain, but there's a need and then a miracle. There's a need and a miracle. And there's this place in between. And some of us want to know, we want to get at the core of that. What changes the situation? What changes the scenario? What changes the problem? What makes things better? Wait, what do we do? What do we do? I mean, we know that somehow, some way, miracles do happen. We know that somehow, some way, those divine experiences do happen. We know somehow, some way, our situations that we're facing, as complex as they are, our family trouble, as difficult and challenging as they are, our issues, somehow, God has come through in a big way. Somehow, God has done amazing things. And I want to point out to you something in a, in a story that we've read here in church before, a story that many of you have read before. It's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And there's something that came out to me this week as I was reading this story in context of what we're talking about today as, as we speak about who God is and what he can do. And if you look at the four different Gospels, you see four different biographies explaining this story. They're kind of seen from different angles and different experiences, but, but they all complement one another. They, they all make the story more understandable. And so as I travel through this, I'm going to speak from several different books of, of the Gospels to explain what I want to share this morning. And so in Matthew chapter 14... 15, we find this first thing. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Seems legit. I mean, seems like a good answer, you know? I mean, I want you to get yourself in this place right now. Jesus had been doing much, much ministry. He had just found out that John the Baptist had been killed. He just found out about that. He gets in a boat and he decides that he's going to sail over the other side. He needs some time away, maybe some, some time to get away from the crowds and everything that's going on. And by the time he enters the other side, there are people already waiting there for him to do miracles. And so he starts doing miracles. He starts reaching people. He starts touching people's lives. And then all of a sudden, there is this massive crowd. It's say five. Or it, is, it, it says, I'm trying to get this right. It says 5,000 people were there, but, but we know that that's just speaking of the men. It's just that there are probably many, many more there. And so the disciples think to themselves, I got a solution for this. They're probably hungry. They know that other people are hungry. So they say, how do we send them away? Just send them away. Send them somewhere else. I, we don't know how to handle this. And I'm telling you that these, people, these disciples must have been overwhelmed with Jesus' response. I want you to think about this. In, in Matthew chapter 14, 16, this is what Jesus said. They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. What? <laughs> I just told you there are that many people here. And I told you that we don't have enough. I'm telling you, Jesus, right now, I've seen you do miracles, Lord. I've seen you do these mighty things. I've seen you bring healings. I've seen you touch people's lives. I've seen you raise the dead. I've seen you do these awesome things, Lord. Are you serious? Don't send them away. You give them something to eat. You give them some food. You give them something. And then in John chapter 6, verse 7, Philip's the first to speak up. And he says, as if to give Jesus some common sense. It would take almost a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one of you, to, or each one to have a bite. And so Philip, being the voice of reason, a year's wages, Jesus, a whole year's wages in order to buy just enough for one single bite of bread. Be realistic, Jesus. This is ridiculous. We don't have enough here. And then in John chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, another of the disciples, Andrew, this is Simon Peter's brother, he speaks up. And he says, 
Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will they go among so many? I don't know. I wasn't in the setting. I wasn't there at that moment. But I imagine that I imagine that Andrew was a little sarcastic with this statement. Here's a sack lunch, Jesus. I mean, there are 5,000 people here. There is so much need here. Here's the problem, Jesus. Here's what I. Here's what we can come up with. I imagine that, that that he's thinking, okay, let's see if Jesus is able to come up with something for this. I imagine that that I don't see. I really don't see a humble man handing this over. I see. I see an Andrew that's kind of like, whatever, Lord. We'll see what happens. I mean, this is the best I can come up with. This is as much as we have. I, I stole some boys' lunch. Small barley loaves, and there's five small barley loaves. They make it mention, they, they say small on purpose. Small barley loaves and two small fish. What is this going to do with such a great need? And here is where the story in what I want to say this morning really brings light to our perspective when we face problems that are so great. When we face troubles that are so overwhelming, when we face things that we just don't know how to overcome. This is what Jesus says. Bring them here to me. I want you to think about that statement for just a moment. We're thinking of the needs that we face. We're thinking of the troubles that we face. We're thinking of this scenario and this situation. Bring them here to me. And then there are two, there are either or two different, you know, settings to this. The disciples were either sitting on the edge of their seat wondering how Jesus was going to do such a great miracle or they were standing there watching waiting for a moment to say, I told you so. I don't know where the disciples were. I don't know what their setting or their thoughts were, but, but I imagine that sometimes when we face troubles or sometimes when we think of our own what we have and how we're going to provide for a need or how God is going to do something in our life with what little we have Sometimes when Jesus says, bring them here to me, if we, if we are on the edge of our seat waiting for God to do something so massive and so incredible, or if we sit back and say, okay, we'll see what we do. We'll see what happens. I don't know. We'll see what, we'll see what you have for me. And we read the story, and we know what happens here. We know what takes place here. We know that in John chapter 6, um, verse 6, he had already had in mind what he was going to do. We know that this was a teaching moment for the disciples. Jesus already had in mind how this was going to play out. He already knew what he was going to do. He was asking them those questions on purpose because he wanted to reveal to them something so very important. And then in Matthew chapter 14, 19 through 21, it goes on to say, And he directed the people to sit down in the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, in looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up the twelve baskets of broken pieces and that, that were left over. And the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. And each one of the Gospels said that there were twelve baskets left over. God provided, and then some. God provided and then some. God provided so much. And they counted 5,000, but that's not including the, the women and children. And women in that day didn't have birth control, so they probably had lots of kids around. Some scholars tend to believe that there could have been as many as 30,000 people in this setting. Think about this. Think about this. I imagine that people, the 30,000 or however many were sitting there, wondered if this was real, like, as it was traveling back like telephone. As, as people were saying, oh, you never know what I just saw. I saw Jesus break bread and, and, and you know, and, and start to distribute the fish and bread, and there was this and there was this little boy sack lunch. I imagine that in the back of the crowd, some people were like, yeah, okay, we'll see. You know, I imagine, I wonder even, and this has been, you know, this is clear, and this happens, I wonder if some people read this story as well as other stories that they found in the Bible and say, I wonder if the disciples elaborated a little bit on that. I wonder if they added some details to make it seem a little more exciting or a little more miraculous. And we find ourselves in these places where we're doubting 
or we really wonder if it's real, if we really wonder if it happened, if it really took place, in taking this into consideration, taking this truth, taking this reality into our hearts, there's something so powerful that we can understand here. And the thing that I want to say to you this morning, and, and this, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Take it to Jesus. That's when the miracle happened. That's when that moment of multiplication took place. That's when the obstacle that was before them was overcome. You see, the disciples are looking at an obstacle. Jesus is looking at an opportunity. The disciples are looking at a trouble. They're looking at something that just seems way too impossible. But Jesus sees an opportunity to shine bright and show something so amazing and do something so incredible. You guys ever really read through the miracles of Jesus in the, in the, in the Gospels? Have you really understood what powerful things Jesus was able to accomplish in his ministry? Jesus controlled nature. He healed the sick. He commanded the dead to life. I mean, Jesus did amazing things. And we're running around frantically. I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. Oh, this is all I've got. I've got a sack launcher. I've got, I've got this little bit in this need. is so big. God, what are you going to do? How are you going to help me through this? I don't know anymore. And we're all hoarding it to ourselves and holding on to it, not giving it to Jesus, not releasing it to his kid. Let me read through some things that I wrote down real quick. This is so powerful. Catch this. You will never know what could have been what Jesus could have done, you will never know what he could have done unless you bring it to him. You'll never know what God can do with what you have until you bring it to him. Listen to this. When we trust Jesus with what is dead, he brings it into life. When we trust Jesus with what is broken, he makes it whole again in a new way. When we trust Jesus with what is sick, he brings healing and restoration. When we trust Jesus with what we lack, he brings more than enough. When we trust Jesus with our anxiety, he gives us peace. When we trust Jesus with our weaknesses, he, will, he brings back to us strength. He backs us with his mighty strength. When we trust Jesus with our money, we will be blessed. When we trust Jesus with our pain, he creates a place of purpose. When we trust Jesus with our family, he will shape generations to come. When we trust Jesus with our friends, he will create in us disciple makers. Think about it. Think about this. Realize that your gifts, your talents, your abilities, what God has given you can be used in mighty, 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 mighty ways. Second Corinthians 5.17, God's Word translation says, Whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. There is a new way of living has come into existence. A new way of living. A new way of living. A new purpose. A new destiny. A new experience. A new life. It doesn't matter how capable or incapable we think we are. He's capable of way more. God is less concerned with your ability as he is with your availability. What this boy had was relatively meaningless to the situation. It was relatively meaningless. It was a sack lunch, it was five loaves and two fish. According to the situation, the scenario what laid before them, what this boy had was relatively meaningless. But he made himself available. He made himself available. We've got to do the same thing. I'm telling you, when we bring it to Jesus, when we bring our lives to Jesus, when we bring our pains to Jesus, when we bring our struggles to Jesus, when we trust our monies to Jesus, when we trust our lives to Jesus, there is so much that he's going to do in us that are going to amaze us. Feeding thousands is just going to be the start. Wouldn't it be amazing if this church became an epicenter for thousands to be fed? Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing for this church to be a place where not only 
nourished in stomach, but nourished in soul, that people found the hope that they so desperately need in this place. Because of you. God can do this. In 2 Peter 1 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of Him who called us by His glory and goodness. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life. Everything we need for godly life. And where are you in this? Where are you in this situation? Where are you in this scenario? Guys, the local church, right here, we, right here in this place, Lancaster Assembly of God, is God's answer to a broken world. What we do here, what we say here, what we accomplish here, what we endeavor to do, this local church, Start doing. We've got to start doing. I want to be that person that people say because of you. Not because I want to be pumped up, not because I want to be prideful, not because I want to say, look what I accomplished. I want to be in that place because I know that it's there that God is working most in my life. Do you want to be there? Do you want to accomplish that? Do you want to be in that place? When you bring what you have to Jesus, when you bring what you have to God, He does with it what only He can do. He does what only He can do. Listen to 1 John 4, 12. This is beautiful. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. We love one another. It's a representation, it's an expression, it's an experience of God's love. It's a definition, it's, it's a defining moment. We get to show each other, we get to show the world around us what that love is. Because when we decide to entrust our resources, when we say, I'm going to bring it to Jesus, it matters in three different ways. It matters to them, it matters to us, and it matters to you. And it matters to the people that you come in contact with and you affect positively in great ways. When I say it matters to us, I mean the church. I mean the church. I mean that when you get involved, when you engage. And I, I know that God wants to do so much here. And God is already doing so much here. But I, I've said this week after week. I want you to connect with this spot. We need you. We need you to participate. We need you to help. We need you to get involved. We need you to be a part of what's going on. I'm going to hand out a, a, a bulletin board, or maybe even send it to the back there. <laughs> and I want to ask you, there's four areas that I'm thinking of that I'm considering this morning. Four areas that I've been, that I've been pondering that God has been trying to, uh, or been speaking to me about. And, and I, I want to ask you to pray about these areas. And I, I want you to consider this. I want you to consider this. How can I take the next step of involvement? How can I take the next step of engaging this church? We need help with the nursery. Keep it real. We need help with the nursery. We need help with our kids' church. My wife is, and, and this is not... This is not a, you know, bragging about my wife, but she's been in doing the kids' church since we started. She's been down there for two years. And I'm thankful every day that she's engaged. And now we have other groups that are getting involved, and that's amazing. She's down there every other week. And church, I would love to see the place where the church involves themselves, and she wouldn't have to be down there every week or every other week. But she could be here. She could be a part of what's going on here. We need, we need that. We need that. It's important. My wife needs nourishment just like you guys do. So I'm, I'm just, I'm coming to you, I'm, I'm asking. I'm just asking. If that's something that you think you can do, I know we're, we're gonna have to, you know, we'll look at your name and we'll have to look into some things and make sure. I mean, we're talking about working with children. You understand that. You understand that. 
You who are parents, you want me to make sure that you, the people that are with your kids will be trusted. Okay. It's the same with the nursery. We need nursery workers. We need people to step up. Well, come on. Some of you people love to coddle babies. Maybe your opportunity. Outbreak student ministries. Every Thursday night, we've got a student ministry that's happening. And some of our leaders are leaving for college. They're going to be gone. They're going to school. We need some leaders to work with our teenagers, some leaders who are not afraid to speak up, some people that are not afraid to share about what God's doing in our life. There is no one person that, 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 that holds the platform on those Thursday nights. It is a group conversation and discussion. Every week, other people are given an opportunity to share. And this is something that God has really been putting on my heart. I've been asking some of you, and, and some of you have stepped up, but we need greeters in this house. We need people standing at the door so that when people come in that we've never seen before, get lit up with smiling faces and a lot of love. Not like uncomfortable, awkward love, but, you know, a lot of love. We want people to know when they come into this church, whoa, they're glad I'm here. What's going on in this place? And some of you younger folks, this might be an opportunity for you because this is this is just my thoughts and this is just me thinking and, and, and I'm going to shut up in just a second. But when, when the weather gets bad, when the snow falls and it's icy out there, I think some of us should be out there escorting some of the folks that need help into the building, into the building. Maybe some of us can step out and let people pull up and then go and park for them. If you can trust them, I'm You know what I'm saying though? Like we need people that are greeting, that are loving people, that are engaging them as they come in. And these are just four areas that God has dropped in my heart to ask you about. Because the local church, what's happening here is an opportunity to engage people with the love of Christ. And I want our church to be that place. I want our church to to be the setting, the environment where people in this church that belong to this church, that go to this church, reveal to everyone around them that they're not afraid to bring everything that they're struggling with, everything that they're dealing with to Jesus. And watch as he transforms it. I mean, like, one of the most ex incredible experiences that I've had in my life and I've watched in others is when Jesus turns pain to purpose. That's just amazing to me. What hurts, what causes people to suffer, the mistakes of their past, the failures of their choices, the, the, the decisions that have caused them such suffering, or the things that have happened to them. And Jesus transforms that. And we watch as what could have been a place that caused us such pain, could have stifled our growth and caused us to not live fully in Him, and has now become His purpose, His divine purpose. Give it to Jesus. Some of you might have missed that part of, of when you've read over and over again, when you've read the, the story of the five loaves and two fish. Some of you may even have heard this preach before. Some of you might even already be in this place and praise God that you're giving it to Jesus. But this last question I want to ask you what have you yet to bring to Jesus? What is it? What is it? Is it your troubles? Is it your finances? Is it, is it your family? You have a child that's unruly and challenging and difficult and just completely erratic. What do you have yet to give to Jesus? Some of us in this room, we, we have experienced the trauma of, of marriage being falling apart. What if we get to give to Jesus? What if we get to let him have some of us as children experience suffering that so many do not even begin to understand. What have you yet to give Jesus? What have you yet to trust to his care? We're hoarders sometimes. We want to do it ourselves. By nature, we are control freaks. We are. Anyone you disagree with me, you shake your head, no, we're not. We're control freaks. We hold on to things and we want to deal with it ourselves. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, give it to him. Just give it to him. And watch as he uses what could have been a stumbling block in your life to be a step by step. 
an opportunity for you to minister to the person, to change the lives of people. What if you have yet to give to Jesus? Some of you have giftings and skills that he wants to use in this church, and you have yet to respond. I need your help. Do. This is a quick way for leadership to head towards the to do it all. I love you guys, and I can we need you to respond to the things that God is calling you to respond to, to get involved, to get involved. And just watch, man, as the foundation grows, as God builds upon what he's doing here, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm grinning big. Christ, I thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for those who are dealing with it to be here today. I pray, Lord, that you would pull us down as we jump in our cross. I pray, Jesus, right now that this question that's been asked of us, even myself, whatever it is, I pray that we would respond. There be a sickness, whether it be a financial difficulty, whether it be a trouble that we're facing, whether it be any kind of difficulty that we have in this life, a scenario where we're stepping back and we're wondering anxiously, how do we change this? Overwhelmed, we don't know the words to say or what to do. That we would bring it to you. In Jesus Christ, that we would say it's yours, that we would respond and say, Jesus, I give this to you, and we would watch in amazement as you do what only you can do. Or we'll never know. God, I'll never know. These people will never know what you could have done with what we have if we don't hand it over. So I pray, God, that we would trust you with everything and we would watch you unleash a blessing that we could never have imagined. God, that you would work in such mighty ways. And I pray that you would spur the hearts of these people, Lord, that they would get involved, that they would engage in this place, that they would write their names down, that they would write down on this list that they want to be involved in what's happening here. That they would give their time and their talents and their abilities to you. And Jesus, that you would do amazing things as a result of their decision to sacrifice. In a wonderful, amazing moment of prayer. That's what you said. Amen. Amen. Amen.